the LGBTIQ USA labyrinth. So just to begin, we're going to go into each one individually. So I, I, just, I just want to give you a snapshot of what it is that we're going to be looking at here. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, <coughs> transsexual, intersex, queer, questioning, two-spirit, asexual, and allies. Just for visual references, I've separated each of these by color. The blue is uh, the, the ones that, that speak to sexual orientation, which is who you are physically and emotionally attracted to. Uh, the green is the ones that represent gender identities, and that is your sense of yourself as male, female, both or neither. So this is quite distinct from sexual orientation. And then the ones in red are the ones that would would speak to uh, either both sexual orientation and gender identities, or neither, or or, or just something else altogether. Uh, oh, and one thing that's very important here: if we're going to be taking a look, this is this is what I find is the most commonly used long form acronym. Uh, to represent sexual and gender diversity. But there's all kinds of, of, there are acronyms that are way, way, way longer. Most commonly you'll see just LGBT or LGBTQ, and that's sort of the umbrella for everybody. But I figure if we're going to be taking a look at the whole picture of sexual and gender diversity, we probably shouldn't overlook the minorities within the minority groups, right? So I'm going to, just, this is just what we're going to be doing. We can be going through a whole lot more. So. Even this doesn't represent everybody. There's a great deal more diversity than, that exists than even what we're going to be taking a look at here. But if we're going to be looking at the big picture here, there are two groups that I think are so often left out of the big picture of sexual and gender diversity altogether. And I think it's a terrible omission, so I'm going to add them in. Because they're such significant groups. First one, heterosexuals. You may have encountered some of them in the course of your lives. It's quite a larger group. But for some reason, we tend to not look at this group when we're looking at sexual and gender diversity. This is part of the diversity of analysis. And cisgender people. Again, very large group of people, and far too often overlooked. So, we're going to go into each of them, but we're going to begin now. Oops. Heterosexual. So, that would be, if you don't know, a man who is physically and emotionally attracted to women, or a woman who is physically and emotionally attracted to men. Bear with me if you're familiar with some of this. It will get a little more complicated as we go along. And then we have lesbians. And that would be a woman who is physically and emotionally attracted to women. Nice and simple. We have gay, that would be a man, who is physically and emotionally attracted to men. We have bisexual. And that would be either a woman who is physically and emotionally attracted to both men and women, or a man who is physically and emotionally attracted to both men and women. And I want to point out here that this was this was a real challenge, a bit of a challenge to represent artistically, right? And I, I, I just want to point out that just because I've drawn it that way, it's just a representation. One of the common stereotypes about bisexuals is that they can't be monogamous, or that they're just confused, or that you know they're right, they can't make up their minds. And so I just draw it that way. It's just a representation. But there's no reason to suggest that bisexuals can't be just as monogamous or just as not monogamous as any other form of sexual orientation. It's just a just a drawing. Um, and so now before before we go into the T's, the gender identities here, I'm just going to skip over to the second to last A there. And that would be asexual, because that's the last of sexual orientations. I'd like to look at those together. And an asexual is a person who doesn't experience sexual attraction. So an asexual, rather than like with lesbian, gay, bisexual, or heterosexual people who are emotionally and physically attracted, an asexual would only be emotionally attracted. The physical attraction isn't there. The sexual attraction isn't there. So, they, they may be single, they may be in a relationship that looks like a gay relationship, they may be in a relationship that looks like a heterosexual relationship, uh, because what's between the likes doesn't matter. And typically, asexuals find that they're attracted to personalities rather than to than to somebody's physical appearance, right? And I, I, I don't know if you caught that, to represent that art artistically, but between 
So they may look like they're bisexual, they may look like they're lesbian, they may look like they're bisexual. But the only difference really between asexual and bisexual here, um, artistically, you might notice that I've just um, basically taken out the uh, frog. Right? <laughs> 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 Not that, right? All right. And then we go into transgender, which is one great big umbrella term. Okay? And that's for anybody who transgresses gender boundaries. And it's very important to point out that transgender is a self-identifying term. You don't go up to somebody on the street and say, you are you're a transgender person. You look like a transgender person. A person will come up to you and say, I am a transgender person. I identify that way. So you might have some that, you know, for example, you might have a man who likes to dress up in women's clothes. And if they identify as transgender, then they are transgender. If they don't, then they're not. It's a self-identifying term. And it applies to a whole range of people. For example, like I just mentioned, cross-dressers. And that would be, for example, a man who enjoys the experience of, of wearing men, women's clothing. And this could be for any, any reason. It could be for fun, it could be for pleasure, it could be for shock, it could be for, for whatever. And there's all kinds of reasons that people like to experience pushing boundaries or, or just something different or experiencing a different role, right? Social, social role. Uh, or it could be, I guess, you know, women, I guess, could also cross-dress and wear men's clothes in our society that just tends to be perfectly normal, so. Uh, or it could be, uh, for example, a drag queen or a drag king. And a drag queen, this would be a man who dresses up uh, as a woman for performance purposes. A drag queen, this is, this is a performance it may or may not have anything whatsoever to do with a person's gender identity or sexual orientation. Um, and likewise, a drag king, that would be a woman who dresses up as a man for performance purposes. It's an entertainment. And again, it may have little or nothing whatsoever to do with their gender identity or their sexual orientation. But it's the crossing of those gender boundaries. Or it could be, for example, somebody who identifies as genderless. There are people who don't have a sense of themselves as either male or female. There are also people who would identify as bi-gender, being both male and female. Um, or it could be, you know, there are some people who identify as genderqueer, for example, and who would, uh, some of them like to use pronouns that blur the male and the female or combine them, like Z instead of he or she, or here instead of his or her. Right? So it's kind of interesting. There's all kinds of people that fall into this. I can't, I, artistically even, I can't even capture all of them. <laughs> this is just a little snapshot. And the other T, that would be transsexual. And that would be someone like me. Uh, I was born a little girl, and I just always sort of had a sense of myself as being male. Uh, and with a transsexual, there tends to be a strong desire to align your body physically with your sense of yourself, your internal sense of gender, uh, which would involve typically transitioning. So a transsexual is a transgender person. It's within the transgender umbrella, but they're quite distinct as a group within that umbrella. So they tend to get their own little T in the acronym there. And then we're going to skip over here to the uh, cisgender. And I don't know if you know who that is. That's my wife, Sharon. And she is an example of a cisgender person. She was born female. She feels like a female. She's extremely female. And the majority of the population would fall under this category of cisgender. The difference between cisgender, transgender, trans meaning across, cis meaning same, right? So that's the majority of the population. I don't think we should leave them out of our basic understanding of the diversity that exists. Next, the I, intersex. And this is very, very interesting. I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with the intersex condition, but it's shocking that we don't hear about this that it occurs, uh, because it, it occurs so often that you think it would just be part of our common social consciousness of not just the, the sexual and gender diversity, but the natural variation that occurs biologically in our bodies. When asked how often a child is born, so noticeably atypical in terms of genitalia that a specialist in sex differentiation is called in, is between 1 in 1,500 births and 1 in 2,000 births. That's how often a specialist is called in to determine what sex the child actually is. Because an intersex person 
as a combination of male and female anatomy. And 1 in 1500 to 1 in 2000, that's already quite a lot. But that's only the ones that have the external, the visually externally ambiguous, for example, ambiguous genitalia. But the number of conditions that exist that fall into this category, which could be your chromosomes. We have XY chromosomes, XX chromosomes. But there's a whole, whole lot of XXYY, XXY. There's all kinds of chromosomal uh, variation that occurs. There's, um, you could have, um, you know, for example, a woman who has testes, undescended testes internally. And you might not discover this until they reach puberty and discover that they're not getting they're not uh, given the period. And then they go in and they find out, oh, you actually have an intersex condition. So the actual, according to the Intersex Society of North America, the total number of bodies that differ from the standard male and female are as many as one in 100 births. This is extremely common. So the idea that we have that you are either male or female goes up the window awfully quickly when you take a look at what actually exists. The data is there. This is not made up of the blue. And unfortunately, with the intersex condition, um, they say that as many as uh, one in 500 and one in uh, 1,000 births uh, endure surgeries to normalize their genital appearance. They're operated on as babies to try to make them fit into a box of male or female, which is a real shame. Um, and I like there was a BBC documentary called Me, My Sex, and I. I highly recommend it. It's very good. One lady in that documentary says, the doctor, I think, she says, we've been fed by a tale of two sexes. And I thought that was a really, a really interesting comment. Then we have the Q, queer. And this is, I think it's a wonderful word. However, you have to be very delicate with this word because there, it, it's, it's, there are many people who have experienced it being used very abusively, very violently, especially in the past. These days, the generations that are coming out now are reclaiming this term because it's such a wonderful term. You could be thought like, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, trans woman, trans man, intersex, asexual, bisexual, heterosexual, gay, you know, and it goes on and on and on and on. And sometimes it's just easier to say, I'm queer, right? So more and more people today don't want to have to box themselves into that category and that category and check this box and that box. And I think this kind of now that label, this kind of fits. It's liberating to be able to just say I'm queer, not otherwise defined, and I don't want to, and I don't need to. But we have to be very, also very conscious that, particularly the older generations, they have very strong negative associations with this term. And one of the ways that I like to look at it now is that, like with the, a toxic waste site, right, where, where you have to remediate the land to make it healthy again, so you can use it for healthy purposes. I, I, I think of that word in a, in a similar way that we're remediating it, we're cleaning it up, so that it can be used again in a healthy way. Second cue, questioning. That would be, well, people who just kind of need a little bit more time to figure things out. And then two-spirited. I love this term. This is one of my, this is one of my favorite words. However, every time I've heard somebody teaching about two-spirited, it's been made very, very clear that this is a First Nations term and it is inappropriate for anybody who's not First Nations to adopt this term. Goodness knows that these communities have had enough appropriated from them and stolen from them. That if they want to keep their language within their particular social and cultural context, I think it's very important that we respect that. But I like it because it, it expresses something so simply and so beautifully. Um, like for me, I, I really do have a sense that there is a female and male spirit within me. More male than female, but they're there, right? Um, but it, it's important that this is recognized as a First Nations term. And traditionally, in First Nations culture, at, well, let me first point out here that two-spirited doesn't just mean somebody like me, a trans person. That they use this term for everybody lesbian, gay, bisexual, or trans. They understand it all within that one context of having both elements of the male and the female within them. So I think it's very important that we be aware that depending on the, the culture, the society, there are different ways to understand the diversity that exists. We like to come up with 
a million letters in a long acronym that nobody can ever keep straight, and they like to just look at it very simply. Right? And traditionally, this the status of being two-spirited before the colonists came in and the religious influences came in, it has been a revered status. Their two-spirited people have been leaders. They have been recognized as the wise ones. Right? So me, yeah, I like to picture myself at the top of the totem pole. <laughs> but um, as, as people who have the privilege of looking at the world through two perspectives at once, right, it's seen as a privilege and a, and a revered status. I think that's wonderful. I think that's just nice. Uh, and then uh, finally, allies. Uh, and that would be anybody who is a friend and a support to all of these people. Um, and, I mean, I don't have to tell you that. I think I have a feeling I'm speaking to pretty much a room full of allies here, right? So you know what an ally is, I hope. Uh, but we do like to include allies. You'll, you'll very often see allies included in this acronym because there's so many reasons. But one of the main reasons is that allies uh, very often are subjected to the same kind of prejudice and discrimination that, that sexual and gender minorities face. You know, like when I first came out to my parents, um, my mom explained it one way as my coming out put them in the closet and they had to find their own way to come out to everybody that they've always known that why they used to have you know, three daughters and a son and now two sons and two daughters, you know, and then face the reactions that people have and the prejudices and the losing of communities and churches and things like that. So similar experiences um, and the ally factor is so important because there are only so many of us we are minorities but the allies is this vast population of people who can act as a bridge between sexual and gender minorities and people who just don't get it so they're absolutely critical we'd be very very weak without the ally factor and it could be family or teachers or friends or person sitting next to you you may not know maybe an ally so that could be gay straight alliances, P flag, parents and friends of lesbians and gays. Um, and well, that's that's just the, the big picture. And there are so many people who weren't included in that little, very quick little snapshot. Um, there's no way. There are as many ways to be as there are human beings, right? But that's just a representing of a few. And and it's not a question of accepting or rejecting or approving or not approving. It's a question of what is. And if we were even just to look at lesbian, gay, and bisexuals, they represent 10% of the population. That's a massive, and that's over, that's not even transsexual, trend. you know, it's just lesbian, gay, and bisexuals, 10% of the population. And that is the same number of people as are left-handed. And I found a really neat quote that I'd like to read to you about that. Um, the analogy between being gay, lesbian, and bisexual and being left-handed is a strong one. One in ten people is thought to be left-handed. As recently as 50 years ago, children had their left hands tied behind their back to encourage right-handedness. The Bible has condemnations against left-handed people. The word sinister comes from the Latin for left. Nowadays, we no longer view left-handedness as evil. We do not ask what causes left-handedness in an effort to stand out. Instead, we wonder, how should we recognize and accommodate this particular minority among us? Perhaps we can begin to ask the same questions about sexual minorities. Rather than trying to ask the question, what causes homosexuality and bisexuality and how can we stop it? Perhaps we should ask, what causes homophobia and biphobia and how can we stop it? When we can answer the questions, the other questions may seem irrelevant. So speaking of homophobia and biphobia, let's take a brief little look at what I call isms and phobias. Because so often the response that people, if they don't understand something, right, is, is uh, I, don't, I fear, I, we, we fear what we don't understand, don't we? This is, this is, doesn't just apply to sexual and gender minorities. We fear what we don't understand. And that tends to be a very common reaction when people come out to people who just don't get it. So let's take a look at some of them. Heterosexism. That would be the, the main one, the most common one. And that is the sense, the belief that heterosexuality is normal or superior. 
to other sexual orientations. And that could be anything from, um, you know, not allowing gay marriage because, well, that's just an inferior form of relationship. It's not valid. Um, or it could be uh, not allowing an option or not allowing a spouse in an emergency room because you're not really family. This is heterosexism. There's a cissexism. And that would be the belief that trans, uh, transsexual gender identities are inferior to or less authentic than cissexual gender identities. So the sense that me feeling like a guy is less valid than Sharon feeling like a girl. And again, very, very, very common. Especially, unfortunately, among trans women. They find a, a great deal of reluctance <coughs> for people to really recognize that this is a woman. This is not a man looking like a woman. It's a woman. There is monosexism. And this one was weird. Honestly, it was in preparing this presentation that I even came across the term. I'd never even heard of it before. And that is the sense that homosexuality and heterosexuality are superior to bisexuality. Right? Uh, we'll just just pick one or the other. This in, this both. I, you know, you're just confused. You're just mentally ill. You're just, you can't make up your mind. And it seems laughable. At least be gay. At least be straight. It seems laughable. And yet it is so common. It is so common. We'll, we'll see that a little bit more as we go along. Genderism. And that is the, the belief that there are only two genders, male and female, and that gender is based solely in biology. So the idea of biological destiny, or a male can become a man, you know, can act like a man, etc. Um, and that, so the, the idea then that trans people are mentally ill, or that intersex people are freaks of nature, rather than part of the natural variation that exists. And then the phobia is homophobia. I think we're probably all familiar with what that is. That is, it's defined as the fear or hatred of gay people, homosexuals. And, I mean, there's some truth to that, but I don't like the definition. I don't like it because when I have experienced homophobia, I, I don't think that the people would say that they fear gay people or that they hate gay people. It would just be something much, much subtler than that. Or, I, I just, it's just gross. I just want to think, well, you, whatever, you live, let live. Uh, but I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to think about it. Or, you know, just calling it Lisbia and as you walk down the street in Montreal or whatever it happens to be. Just little things like that on a day-to-day -day basis. But I don't think that they would say that they're afraid or that they hate. Fear and hatred have so many expressions and the people who perpetrate them are usually completely unaware that that's what is actually at the root of it. So when I say fear or hatred, you know that it's not just outright fear and outright hatred, even though sometimes that's exactly what it is. Uh, and then my phobia. That would be, by comparison, the fear or hatred of bisexuals, transphobia, the fear or hatred of trans people. And what's interesting about these, interesting, I guess if you could use that word for it, but is that it, there's, they overlap, right? It, they, they, they're, they're each given their own term, but it, it's all part of the same thing. So for example, like a trans woman, might be walking down the street and she might get gay bashed because she's perceived as a really effeminate gay man. Um, so sometimes transphobia is actually homophobia being expressed. And likewise, sometimes uh, an effeminate gay man may be attacked because of the, the way that they express themselves. The, 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 the gender expression may be seen as effeminate and then attacked because of it. And that could be considered transphobia, right? And so they're all connected. It all has to do with the, the discomfort that people generally feel about any kind of transgression of what they perceive to be the norms, especially when it comes to sex and gender, which make people very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable. So I think it's important to just debunk this whole silly idea that we have of biological destiny. And I'm just going to read this quote to you here. One of the great myths of our culture is that at birth, each infant can be identified as distinctly male or female, biological sex, will grow up to have correspondingly masculine or feminine behavior, public gender, live as a man or a woman, 
social gender role, and marry a woman or a man, heterosexual orientation. This is not so. A significant number of people, in fact, do not fit the simple idea of biological gender destiny. So, let's take a look at sexual and gender spectrum. Because they are spectra. Each, it, sex is a spectrum. Gender is a spectrum. Sexual orientation is a spectrum. And what is a spectrum, right? I looked it up. Because I know what it is, but sometimes you need to look it up to really know what it is. And a spectrum is, is like with light. They compare it to light. Where there's an infinite variation along a continuum. Infinite variation. There's, there are as many colors in the stream of light as it's an infinite, right? So there isn't this point, that point, that point. So if you were to take a look at something like biological sex, for example, oh, and that whole idea of the light and the infinite variation that occurs along the spectrum. Well, what is that? The rainbow flag. Hey, right? sometimes when you wonder, the rainbow flag, it is all of the diversity that exists. The spectrum of light. I thought that was kind of a neat little thing. So, for example, and it, there are many different spectra. So, let's take a look at each one of them. Biological sex. We've looked at the, the whole intersex thing. So the idea that people are either born male or female is just... It, it, it doesn't, that doesn't not reflect it in reality. So you could be uh, really almost fully both biologically male and female in a certain sense, or you could be almost fully male, but then there's something biologically that is actually a female, like a chromosomal, uh, a subtle kind of thing. So you can find yourself anywhere along that spectrum in terms of your actual biology. Your gender identity, this is something, again, very, very separate. So you, your sense of yourself as a man, as a woman, or anywhere in between, uh, from high gender to genderless to the third gender. Many societies around the world recognize three distinct genders. So common, I tried to look up the number of them. Nobody actually gives one number, but you start looking at the list of all of the third genders recognized in societies around the world, and it's just overwhelming. I wouldn't even know where to begin. There's so many of them. And not just today, but going back as far as recorded history. Your gender expression is separate from your gender identity. So anything from fully masculine to fully feminine to anywhere in between and right around the middle is androgyny where it's kind of hard to tell. Your gender expression is very, very gender neutral and you can find yourself anywhere anywhere along that line. Uh, your sexual orientation from exclusively attracted to women to exclusively attracted to men and everything in between including bisexual, both, or asexual, neither. And distinct, again, from sexual orientation is your sexual behavior. Your sexual orientation does not determine your sexual behavior. So it can be anything from exclusively sex with women to exclusively sex with men to sex with both men and women or celibacy, neither, right? And so somebody might be, for example, you might find a lesbian who is in a straight marriage, right? Or a gay man who is celibate. So just having your sexual orientation does not determine your sexual behavior. And it's very important to be aware of that. So, biological, the idea of biological destiny would say, well, you're born a little boy, born male, you're going to grow up to be a man, you're going to, you know, really express yourself in a very masculine kind of Schwarzenegger type of way, you're going to be attracted to women, of course, the women are going to love you, and, well, that one I had to blot out. <laughs> <laughs> and likewise, born a little girl, uh, you're going to feel like a girl, you're going to present in a really feminine manner, men are going to love you, you're going to love them, and again, not for your eyes. <laughs> but it, this goes out the window so quickly, so I, like, take me for example. I already mapped myself on this here. I was born a female, definitely, I had my genes tested, I was curious, but I have definitely XX chromosomes, normal female. And uh, as the um, the person who introduced me, she mentioned a documentary that was made about me on the male side of the middle. So my gender identity, that's sort of where I would place it on, along the spectrum. It's just on the male side of the middle. My gender expression, though, I think is just a little bit more on the masculine side. I'm not the manliest of men, but I'm not the most effeminate either. 
I am exclusively attracted to women. And sexual behavior, well, that's not your amusement. Right? <laughs> so the whole idea that we have of everyone fitting into that category, that category, this side and that side, goes out the window awfully quickly. <laughs> take a look at it. So just, just briefly here, I, let's take a look at some statistics. And I, I should mention that I, I really don't like statistics uh, at all. I, I, like, first of all, you know, who did the study? Where was the study done? When was the study done? Who funded the study? All kinds of questions. I'm always seeing different data there. And who knows what, what the right data is? And also, I just don't like data in that sense. It, it just doesn't seem to speak so much to, to lived experiences. It's so cold. But it's still helpful sometimes. You can get, you can get in a picture. So I've just picked a few. We're going to look at a few. And, um, and just, to, just to get a sense of, of, of the kind of reality that people have to face on a, on a large scale. So we're going to look at mental health, physical health, sexual health, discrimination, and less depressing stuff. Beginning with mental health. So for example, sexual and gender minorities have higher rates of depression, three times higher. <laughs> Substance abuse, twice as high. Anxiety disorders and suicidality. And as we go through some of these, I think that you'll begin to have a sense of why. This isn't just out of the blue. The risk of suicide among lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth is four to 14 times higher than for their heterosexual peers. I've also seen the number six to 16 times higher. And I don't think that the number really matters. It's high. We need to take this stuff seriously. Three out of four transsexuals have been suicidal. Half have attempted suicide. And the suicide rate is as high as one in five. I don't know about you, but I find that very shocking. And yet, not shocking at the same time, unfortunately, because I've, I've lived this. But the good news about this is that treated transsexuals, that's like me, transsexuals who have been given access to, to medical treatment and care that's appropriate to their needs, the suicide rate drops from approximately 1 in 5 to 1 in 100. So we don't know what causes transsexuality, we don't know what the best treatment for it is, but we know that transition works. Sexual minority women are particularly at risk for substance-related disorders, while sexually, sexual minority men have a higher risk of suicide. I just thought this was kind of interesting that Depending on your sex, there's there's differences in the way that we uh, the routes that we take to escape from suffering. Over eighty percent of lesbian, gay, bi, trans youth have reported verbal harassment at school. Physical attacks have been reported by twenty percent of lesbian, gay, bisexual youth, and fifty five percent of trans youth. And uh, this is why it's so important to have things like the P flag active and the GSAs in the schools and the you know, anti-bullying awareness and things like that. Because so much of it is targeted against LGBT youth, or youth perceived to be LGBT. Physical health. 36% of lesbians gay smoke, compared to 16% generally, the stress. And 45% of bisexuals smoke. Bisexuals also report higher rates of alcoholism and mental health issues than other sexual minorities. And this is really interesting because it's only recently that bisexuals have begun to be studied as a distinct group. They used to be lumped in, lesbian, gays, and bisexuals, right? But now researchers have begun to study them distinctly, not lumped in with lesbians and gays, and they're shocked to find that the smoking, the alcoholism, the mental health issues, the health service use is so much higher among bisexuals. And they, they hadn't anticipated that. But of course, to me, it's so obvious. Bisexuals are so often experience rejection from both the heterosexual communities and the gay and lesbian communities. On both sides, there is an inability to understand how this is even possible that somebody could experience attraction to members of either sex. Which is kind of just really ridiculous because it just is. That's just, it just is. It just exists. And in fact, I think that bisexuals represent a huge portion of the population. So the fact that we have such a hard time wrapping our heads around that, 
It's a bit of a mystery, but we're on our way. Gay men are more likely than straight men to experience eating disorders. Body image in the gay community is a real issue. Lesbians, by comparison, are more likely to be overweight than heterosexual women. Men tend to be very visually focused uh, when it comes to attraction, whereas with lesbians, there tends to be this freedom from this need to, to appeal visually to, to, to the, the male, right? And so it's, it's, it's interesting to see those, those differences. Um, health disparities exist oh, within the LGBT populations due to a reluctance to seek medical attention. And this can be anything from, I mean, there are all kinds of studies that, that show that people, uh, lesbians and gays, for example, may have had, or bisexuals also may have had very negative experiences coming up to their doctors. And so they may be very reluctant to go with, even with regular checkups, regular health service use, they may be very reluctant until they can find a doctor that they can trust. Or, for example, a trans man may be reluctant to go and get pap smears and pelvic exams and breast exams leading to much higher rates of uh, cancer, uh, deaths by cancer, and late detections of cancers. And a trans woman may be reluctant to go for a prostate exam, again, resulting in much higher rates of deaths by cancer in the trans communities. An Ontario study found that 25% of lesbians and gays and 58% of bisexuals are not up to their doctors, again, for, for the reasons that I've just discussed. A US study found that 89% of lesbians and bisexual women reported a negative reaction when they came out to their doctor. And a study of US medical students found 25% were strongly homophobic. And 9% viewed homosexuality as a mental disorder, which is just silly because homosexuality was declassified as a mental disorder in 1973. So the idea that today, almost one in 10 medical students in the US consider it a mental disorder is just such a it's a terrible failure on the part of the education system, among other problems. Sexual health. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth often engage in early sexual behavior to prove that they're heterosexual, resulting in higher rates of sexually transmitted infections and higher rates of unplanned pregnancies than their heterosexual peers. I don't know if you find that as shocking as I do, but more lesbians and bisexual women are getting pregnant by accident than heterosexual females. How? Like, what's, what's happening? This is very well documented. More lesbians getting pregnant by accident. Like, what's, what's wrong? Misconceptions about safe sex practices, this is one of the things that's wrong, and heterosexually oriented sex education increase the risk of unplanned pregnancies and sexually transmitted infections. It is so important to have inclusive discussions of these things. Gay men report rates of sexually transmitted infection diagnoses six times higher than that of heterosexual men. And I'm so reluctant to include that in this presentation because it just, there's so many negative stereotypes directed against gay men and, and they says, oh, if you're a gay man, then you must have AIDS and stuff like that. But this is sexually transmitted infections. We're not talking about AIDS here, HIV specifically. But it, we can't leave it out either. Because there is just, when we don't look at, when we don't provide the right education and the right awareness and deal with issues like self-esteem as it relates to your sexual activity, then these are the results. And these people are victims of the sense that we have that it is not okay to be gay and people have to go in secret or they just... There's, there's all kinds of problems here. I mean, I, I, I don't want to play into that negative stereotype, but I also don't want to overlook the effects of overlooking. As a result of poverty and unemployment, many trans women resort to prostitution and are often reluctant to negotiate condom use due to low self-esteem or the fear of violence. Um, unemployment is a terrible problem among trans communities and poverty as well, and self-esteem. and I recently read a study uh, about the HIV transmission rates among trans female sex workers. And it was shocking that it was 27% compared to 4% among non-trans female sex workers. And it can be very hard, and, and emotional attachment, right? I'm afraid to leave me if I, 
makes the best use, that you use condom and things like that. So self-esteem is such a critical issue when it comes to sexual health. Um, discrimination. Just very quickly here, there are the types of discrimination. There's systematic discrimination, and that's where um, an entire group of people is denied the equal opportunities and rights that the rest of society have. So that would be the gay marriage issue, or you know whether or not gays can adopt children, <laughs> or uh, whether or not trans people have access to the health care that's appropriate to their needs. That's a systematic discrimination. Uh, then there's unintentional discrimination which is not, you don't actually desire to, to, to discriminate, but there's a, just a failure to recognize that these people exist. So, for example, uh, some homeless shelters, many homeless, most homeless shelters, rather, uh, don't actually have a, a policy or system in place to take in trans women. So many trans women who are victims of domestic violence or, or any kind of violence <laughs> or homelessness will go to these shelters and be turned away. Because why? Well, we can't allow you here, you know, and it's not that they intend, some do, but most don't. They just simply don't have a way to integrate a transsexual woman into a women's homeless shelter, right? Or, it's not just that. It could be that whole thing that I said about the bisexuals, uh, where they were always lumped in with the lesbians and gays and the studies and everything like that. It's simply a failure to recognize that this group of people may actually have the distinct needs and characteristics, the failure to recognize is unintentional. And then of course there's intentional discrimination. I don't think I really have to explain what that, what that is, but that's a it's a conscious discrimination based on the belief that people don't belong or deserve equitable treatment. So anything from being refused an apartment because you're a trans person, they don't want you there, uh, to somebody being kicked out of a church because they're gay, or not to being allowed to enter into ministry, for example. And it's just intentional. Um, or uh, personal just uh, homophobic and transphobic behaviors enacted on a one, one on one basis, insults or, or you know, giving somebody the evil eye. And it can be very, very subtle or it can be downright blatant. Um, a third of trans people have lost or been denied a job because of their trans identity. And half of trans people live on less than $15,000 a year, which is one of the reasons that they resort to prostitution, because the, the need for surgery can be so strong. The absence of quality of life, and when you can't get it paid for by the healthcare system because they make you run every loop you can think of, and they treat you usually, sometimes not very good along the way, and so they have to raise the money themselves. And if they can't get a job because nobody's going to hire a guy who looks a woman who looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger in a dress, right? They, there's a way to make money. Unfortunately, there's there's quite a market for for that, uh, and. Let's see, the number of hate crimes in Canada motivated by sexual orientation more than doubled from 2007 to 2008 and were the most violent of all hate crimes. So if we're going along thinking, well, these days, is it really such an issue? Why, why do you keep harping on all this stuff? Like, these days, is it really such an issue? Well, apparently it is. When it's not an issue anymore, then we'll stop harping. But until then, we're going to harp. 50% uh, of lesbian and gay youth report parental rejection because of their sexual orientation. Right? So all of those all of those things about depression, mental health issues, and suicidality, and things like that. Well, rejection is a huge part of that. A person without family isn't whole. A person without community isn't whole. Rejection harms people in very real ways. Um, I read somewhere something about that 25, between 25 and 40% of homeless youth are lesbian, gay, bi, or trans, and that 60% of those will resort to prostitution. Less depressing stuff, though. <laughs> this is not all bad. Basically, as far as I'm concerned, we rock. Right? And actually, that's all I have to say on the less depressing stuff category, because we really do. We are not. We are not these freaks of nature. These are unnatural, strange. People, we are awesome people, we are excellent people. And in fact, the LGBT people that I know are among the best people that I know. That's not to say that all the best people I know are lesbian, gay, bi, or trans. But I think all of the lesbian, gay, bi, or trans people that I know are among the best people that I know. It does something to you to experience suffering, 
rejection and hardship and to overcome. Right? I wouldn't wish these experiences on anybody. But it it does something to you. You do, you, you grow stronger. And you become a better person. And a more loving person. And a more accepting person. If you have had these experiences. So frankly, I I love LGBT people. <laughs> so strategies for change. I, there are so many. I, don't, I wouldn't even know where to begin. But just first, I basically, first of all, recognize that rock, right? That goes a long way. Uh, support from family and friends. Positive responses to coming out. Identifying with the LGBT community. All of these things have been scientifically proven to reduce stress, contribute to positive mental health, significantly reduce substance abuse and reduce internalized homophobia and transphobia. So if we care about quality of life, which as far as I'm concerned is the most important thing, then there is no reason whatsoever to deny somebody support, to respond in a positive way to the very vulnerable act of coming out, and there's no reason to put up barriers to people having access to a community of people like them. There is simply no reason. The only thing you can accomplish in doing that is to damage a person. There's no excuse if you care about quality of life at all. Respect. There's no reason, there's never a good reason to not be respectful. And self-awareness, particularly, you know, if we've got some child and youth workers, students in the room here, right? So, it, it, yeah. <laughs> yes. A good, a good, a good generation of child youth workers coming up here. Um, but but self-awareness, particularly also in a professional role, right? If you're sitting there with you know your arms all like, right? Body language, right? Communicates quite a lot. So it's very important to be aware of your own prejudices, your own um, attitudes and beliefs towards these things, and how they translate and how you provide service to people, or just how you treat people on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, oh, I will, obviously, it's so important to have inclusive sexual health discussions. It's just obvious why. Uh, using inclusive language, also, again, from a service provider point of view, right? So you may, somebody may come in and, and you might ask the question, like, you know, so, you know, how is your husband, right? And so right away you've revealed a heterosexual bias uh, if you ask a female about a husband. And then, you know, they may be then reluctant if they realize that there's actually a heterosexual bias here, they may be reluctant to, to correct you and to expose themselves as perhaps not a heterosexual, right? Uh, so you can use a word like partner instead of husband or wife. And just make sure that you maintain a safe environment for the kind of diversion that does exist in vast, vast numbers. No assumptions, right? You might have um, you know, somebody might come to you and talk about a same-sex partner. So you may assume that they are homosexual, but they may be bisexual. They may be asexual. You don't know. It's important not to make assumptions about people. You'd be surprised how, how often it might not actually be what, what, you, what you think. And room for ambiguity, you know, because the, the idea that you have to put everybody into this box or that box or that label, uh, we, we, we get very nervous if we can't place somebody, one way or another. Um, and when it comes to, for example, gender identities, uh, I, I know some people who would consider themselves, themselves gender confused, right? And they may think, oh, because I'm gender confused, I, that must make, you know, you don't want to say, oh, then you're a trans person, you're going to want to transition. Uh, you know, you must be a transsexual then, because you're gender confused. And, and then pushing somebody into some kind of label. It is perfectly okay to just not to be questioned, to be uncertain and to just live there, and to not have to feel that you have to define yourself any further than that. Um, so to allow space for ambiguity. Because, I mean, <laughs> what's the big deal any time? I don't know. And finally, be good, right? And if that's um, a little bit confusing or unclear about what being good actually is, I've just given a little diagram here from negative levels of attitude, positive levels of attitude, everything from repulsion, pity, tolerance, acceptance, into support, admiration, appreciation, and finally, nurturance. 
And in fact, when I, when I did this here, I was thinking, okay, I, I get it. It kind of makes sense to me, but but how that translates into how people treat people or react to people. Like what makes acceptance a little worse than support? Or what makes admiration, you know, a little less than appreciation? So I was trying to think of, of a way to picture this. And then just last night I had, I had my what, thinking of a plant, okay? Bear with me. Okay, so the way that we maybe treat a plant. So with everything from repulsion to just wanting to stamp it out, because you're just, you're just a dirty little plant, and I don't give a crap about you, right? And some people do this stuff. It's just this wanton destruction. To pity. Oh, well, that's just a silly little plant there. That's just a... Uh, they can't even walk around. It's always just stuck in one place. Let's suck to be a plant. <laughs> Uh, to tolerance, okay, you just do your thing over there, I'm just not going to mind you. Nah, I don't care, I'll just, live, whatever, live and let live, I don't care. To acceptance, too, okay, the plant's there, it's, it's all just, okay, again, a little more positive of the live and let live type of thing. No, I just accept that it's there and I'm just going to be rather neutral towards it. Into support, which is, okay, you know what, I'm just going to make sure that maybe that rock is not, you know, crushing the stem or whatever it happens to be, I'll just, you know, whatever, it's, it's okay. I'll take care if there's something that kind of needs to be taken care of, I guess. And to admiration. But you know what? That's actually really kind of remarkable how it grows and what you. That's really, that's really neat. Um, to appreciation. To really see the beauty in a plant. I wonder if you've ever looked really closely enough to, to see the beauty and to appreciate that and taking in of it. And then finally the nurturance. And this is where you cross that boundary to participation, active participation, and where you enter into a relationship with it. And that involves a desire for it to grow, and to blossom, and to be all that it can be. And you participate in that, helping it grow. So I think this whole picture can be made a heck of a lot simpler like that. Let's just drop all the rest and nurture each other. Because why not? All that it will result in is bringing out the best in everybody, and that benefits us all. That's, that's it, I guess. That's my conclusion. There's no reason not.